Welcome to today's episode of the Blueprint Podcast, where we throw out the old blueprint so we can learn to become who we were always meant to be. I'm your host, Jason Smith, and if you haven't already, make sure you click the subscribe button and share the podcast with your friends on social media and tag me in it, at jbirdfit. Today, I have a very special guest for you who is going to blow your mind regarding attachment styles and how they impact all of our relationships. I've followed his content now for a while and he gives so much value regarding relationships and provides a real world perspective as well as tools for you to use today. Matt Pfeiffer is a therapist, speaker, trainer, toxic relationship, narcissism, trauma, and an emotional abuse expert. He is the founder and owner of Matt Pfeiffer Coaching. His training, which features original work, has been presented in multiple states and countries, and he's regularly featured on the radio, in publications, and online. Matthew's videos attract millions of viewers, and his podcast, Toxic to Triumph, has been heard in over 100 different countries and is featured on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and iHeartRadio. Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thank you. My name is Matthew Pfeiffer. I'm a therapist, coach, author, wrote the book, Oh Shit, I Think They're a Fucking Narcissist. I help people who are in toxic relationships. I'm a full-time content creator. I have a marketing agency, bit of an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur. Uh, so I have a cu- couple of different ventures that, that I've gone. So I'm also the CEO of Pfeiffer Media. I help uh, content creator and business owners build and, s- and scale and ramp their businesses. But most people know me for my relationship content, uh, which obviously is the reason why I'm here. And so I help people who are recovering from toxic relationships, who are trying to get their life back in order, recovering from divorces. Um, because what happens a lot of times is people, they're in a toxic relationship and people say, just leave, just leave, just leave. And then they just leave and they start to realize that there's a, a bigger issue at play. Number one, they they struggle finding uh, other healthy individuals when they get back out into the dating scene. They start to discover that they themselves have some toxic traits and behaviors. They start to realize that some of these things are impacting their kids and their friendships and their relationships, and they really don't know how to maneuver through life. And so I help people kind of get get all those things back in order. And so it's one of those things. It's really easy for other people to say, just leave. But then there's no tools on the opposite end of that because right. our family and friends, they, they don't have that level of education. They don't have that know-how. And maybe they just haven't taken the deep dive into this type of content. What are some things, especially, you know, I'm into attachment styles and I try to focus everything on that. How can we relate attachment styles to then getting over a breakup or dealing with a difficult situation in our relationships? When I'm talking to people, I, I think attachment style is huge. One of the things I tell people when they're coming out of a toxic relationship. Uh, One of the things I I don't do, I don't allow for people to just point fingers at their ex, even if their ex was terrible, was awful. Now, it doesn't excuse their poor or bad behavior, especially if they're abusive. I'm not saying that you deserved it or anything like that. But when we talk about attachment styles, we start to learn why we were attracted to that person to begin with, what got us into that relationship. People who have an insecure attachment style stay in toxic relationships far too long. And so I tell people I work with that attachment styles are your ground zero. What We have to get back to ground zero to understand what led us to that point, what kept us into the, in that situation. And if we're going to fix and if we're going to heal that situation, if we're going to make sure, because uh, we, you know, we may not be responsible for the reason why our previous relationship ended, but we are 100% responsible for number one, our healing and to make sure that those things don't happen again. If we don't get back to understanding our attachment style, what we're attracted to, why we're attracted to those things, understanding how our attachment style is impacting other people, the likelihood of you repeating those cycles are very, very high. That's number one. Number two, when we have an insecure attachment style, what people don't talk about enough, people will oftentimes give themselves an excuse for their poor attachment style when it comes to the romantic relationship. When you start to realize that your attachment style impacts how you are as a parent, it impacts you as a coworker, this is how you're showing up as a friend, all of a sudden, you know, your eyes become wide open to how your how this is affecting your entire life, not just your romantic relationships. So I want to take a step back just for a quick second, because we were talking about the pointing of fingers and blame is one of those hugely important things that we have to get ourselves to the point where we stop blaming other people for the circumstances that are happening inside of our own relationship. So there has to be a point where we're able to take ownership to some degree of of our role 
in that dynamic. You're not taking on all the blame. It's not all your fault. Anxious attachers tend to do that exact thing where they're trying to figure out the other person because somehow I did something wrong and they're they're deeply blaming themselves. So we want to get away from that. And the other thing was as a coworker, that is huge. We don't often think about attachment styles as being something that's, you know, impactful in other areas of our life. So what would it look like in a work relationship, my attachment style? How, how would that impact a work relationship? Let's use an anxious attached person for an example. People who struggle with anxious attachment oftentimes feel like a person has one foot out the door. Now, notice I said a person. We think of this as a romantic partner, but this also can play out at, at work. So your supervisor or your coworker has a conversation with you, and as an anxious attached person, because they had conflict with you, you think that you're going to get fired. So you begin to panic, you begin to sweat, you begin to have a lot of anxiety thinking that your job's online. On their end, they're just like, no, I just want you to finish that paperwork by Friday or whatever the case is, right? It doesn't, it's not all black and white where I'm either great on a pedestal or I'm about to get fired. And that's, that's how an anxious attached person tends to think. Someone who might be an avoidant might avoid that conversation altogether. In both scenarios, that can over a course course of time can lead to, I always tell people that when you have an insecure attachment style, either anxious or an avoidant, typically what ends up happening is that you don't re recognize that you have self-sabotaging behavior that leads to self-fulfilling prophecies. So an anxious attached partner might fear that person that you're going to get fired at any point in time and you end up doing things that lead to that. And same thing as an avoidant attached partner. You're avoiding the conversation because you don't want to, you're avoiding the conflict, you're avoiding your supervisor. You may avoid going to work altogether, calling in sick, not going, going in late, trying to, and then what happens, and, and you're avoiding this because you don't want to get fired or you don't want to get written up. You don't want to have those difficult conversations. And then that's exactly what ends up happening because you're avoiding it all together. And then people are wondering, they feel like you're not present at work or that you're always late. And then all of a sudden your behavior that your avoidant type of behavior actually leads to that self-fulfilling prophecy. So then what is one thing that somebody can do to not take corrective action personally at work? One of the things that happens when you have an insecure attachment style that I talk about with people over and over and over again is to stay present. We're oftentimes so worried about the, the future that we're just not present. We're not, we're actually not listening to the other person. We're not putting ourselves in the other person's shoes. So let's say that someone has a conversation with you about paperwork that needs to be turned in and, and you've been late with with the paperwork. When we talk about avoidance, an, an avoidant attached per person or someone who has an anxious attached style at work, really what's happening is that you're, you're, you're being very defensive, right? You're trying to protect yourself from impending doom. When we sit there and we're actually present, we're actually listening to that person, great majority of the time, that person is actually on your side. They're your partner. They actually want to see you do well. That's the reason why they're giving you the constructive criticism that they are. So guess what? You don't get fired. So then guess what? So then the two of you can reach the, the goals that you guys have at work. So when you're actually present and you actually listen to them and you, instead of getting defensive and you take it in and you take exactly what you were talking about before, taking responsibility, you start to realize and you allow, you actually sit with the discomfort of that anxiety and allow for yourself to feel uncomfortable. After the anxiety starts to subside, you start to realize I'm not getting fired. They just want the paperwork on time. Now me not turning the paperwork in on time or whatever the case is, that would get me fired if I continued down this road. But a lot of it is staying present in the here and the now rather than either going into the future and worrying about what's what might happen or going into your past. Can't forget that the reason why people have an insecure attachment style is because oftentimes because of the past, maybe you have gotten fired before. Maybe you have had a supervisor or a coworker who has lied on you before, which has led to this point. And so if we stay present rather than going back into the, into the past or the future, oftentimes it works, works out best for us. There's a couple tools that I'd like to give right about now. And one of the things is a physiological sigh. So as you breathe in through your nose and at the top, you get that extra inhale in. So it looks like this. <sighs> 
and then a long exhale out yeah. and you allow that to be released over an extended period of time, do that three to five times. And you're going to bring yourself from your sympathetic nervous system into your parasympathetic nervous system of rest and relaxation. Yeah. The other thing is just a, a mindset perspective. And it's what you mentioned earlier. And it's just recognizing that the people in your life, they have a role to play. And especially yeah. at work, your boss is your boss and they have a job to perform and they expect you to perform at a certain level. If you have the ability to look at it from their perspective, when they're taking that corrective action, Action. It has nothing to do with you necessarily, nothing negative. It's just saying we have standards and we need you to meet this standard. And as long as you meet this standard or make the attempts to meet this standard, right. then then everything's going to be OK. You're not going to be fired, but we need to see you making that effort consistently. Now that we've talked about our work relationships, mm -hmm. let's go back to our dating relationships. And can you provide some examples of how attachment styles impact communication and conflict resolution in some of our closest relationships? Well, what happens with our relationships, um, I mean, and, and conflict is exactly where oftentimes our insecurity, our insecure attachment styles show up. Oftentimes the avoidant is conflict avoidant and the person who with an anxious attachment style wants to fix everything right here, right now. And, and if they don't get the answers, if they don't get text message or the phone call right here, right now, they think that person is, you know, out the door. And, um, you know, and one of the things that people don't understand in particular when it comes to an avoidant is um, I, I tell people that they have the same level of of anxiety as an anxious attached partner. The difference though, is that they just handle it very different. Everyone is both an anxious and an avoidant are both trying to um, protect themselves from being hurt. They, their focus is actually in on their pain. They both have trust issues. They both are worried. The avoidant is worried about, about their vulnerability taken advantage of. The anxious partner is worried that that person is going to just up and leave at, at any point in time. And what happens, uh, and I see this in your comment section a lot, where an <laughs> anxious attached partner will ask the question, well, how come the avoidant uh, can't just solve everything right here, right now? You have to understand that an avoidant attached person, when they leave a conversation or when they are walking away from the conversation, that that's their way of uh, regulating their own emotions. If they don't, what is, and going back to what we were talking about with the self-fulfilling prophecy, if they don't, the very thing that you're actually worried about is exactly what's going to happen. The words that are going to come out of their mouth, I promise you, are not going to be the things that you want to hear. The goal and the thing that you want from them, you know, to solve and, and to work out the issue, to hear that they still love you, to hear that they're, that they're not going to leave, that's not what you're going to hear. So it's not, it's not good for you or for them. And so that's the reason why it's okay. I know anxious attached partners might say things like, you know, well, the avoidant doesn't take any responsibility. Yes, they do. Their responsibility is to, after they're done regulating their emotions, to make sure that they come back at a decent time to work through uh, whatever conflict that they have. For an anxious attached partner, that doesn't, that doesn't sound like that big of a deal. But you have to understand that just like we were talking about just a second ago, that the avoidant has the same level of anxiety that you do. They're just regulating it very differently. So for them to come back to the conversation, that's difficult for them. It's as difficult for them to come back to the conversation as it is for you to walk away from the conversation. So let's work on both ends. It's important for us to not make it all about us and to look at this as more of a, of a system. One of the things I tell people to do in situations like this early in the relationship and not when things get heated, not when you're all pissed off or anything like that, but to have rules of engagement. What, are, what is it going to look like when, when we have disagreements? What are the rules? Are we allowed to take a break? Can we take a timeout? If we do, how long do you need? And what happens, and especially with the avoidant, if you're someone who is an avoidant, it's important to have these conversations to know how long does it take me to self-regulate? Does it take me an hour? Does it take me three days? And what happens is that when you have that conversation, when your anxious attached partner knows what to expect, when the when the heat of the battle starts and we know what to expect the level of anxiety and the and the contention typically isn't that high this is the reason why we have uh when we look at the real world we do this all the time we have fire drills when you get on a plane 
They tell you exactly where all the exits are. They tell you what to do in an emergency situation. So then guess what? So then people don't panic. God forbid that there is a situation. And it's the same thing with relationships. The more prepared that you are before the heat of the moment, the better that you're going to be in the heat of the moment. Uh, I always use this uh, this analogy. I don't know if you remember. Do you remember that fire in Chicago probably like 15, 20 years ago? There's a fire, fire in a nightclub in Chicago. What ended up happening, more people perished in that fire than what needed to. What happened was that there was, you know, I guess a concert or band that was playing. Pyrotechnics went off, malfunctioned, and everyone tried to leave out the same door they came in, right? When they did the research and they did the study. It was the, the E2 nightclub is what it yep. was. Yeah. And so they, so everyone tried to leave out the same door that they came in and a couple of people, a handful of people got trapped in the door. And unfortunately, a lot of people perished that they shouldn't have. But when they reviewed the video and did all the research, what they find, found out there was, there's actually exits all throughout the venue and, ha and some people... The exit was literally right next to them, but they didn't know that. And it's the same thing when we talk about conflict and, and relationships. Oftentimes we have all of the resolutions that we need. We have everything that we need, but if we panic, we're going to go out the door that we came in, meaning that we're going to go back to our original attachment style. We're going to go back to our old behavior. We're going to go back to yelling and screaming and doing things that are going to be counterproductive to resolving issues in a relationship. If we understand, if we know that my partner needs some time, needs a timeout, and I know that my partner is going to come back in an hour, if I know that um, my partner needs for me to come back in an hour and to and to fill a promise to resolve these issues, my partner needs me to be proactive about text messages. And uh, then what happens is that we're not going to avoid conflict, but what happens is that we can get to resolutions a lot faster and we don't have to stay in, in, in contentious situations for long, long stretches of time. When we're in that heightened state of activation. How do we communicate that to our partner? Like what's a tool that we could use? Because like you said, we go into that default mode of, you know, who we are, who we've been. It's that default programming. It's the things that we've learned. It's epigenetic. It's in our DNA. It's experiences that we've had our entire lives that are all coming out in this one moment. We're having that experience. How do we communicate that to our partner that I, I just, I need a break, but they can't get the words out that I need a break. When you're having that conversation, when you're setting up the rules of engagement, we always talk about safe words when it comes to sex, when it comes to all sorts of things, but we don't talk about it when it comes to having conflict and when we have heated conversations. Have a safe word where it doesn't necessarily mean that the other person is bad, but if you feel like you are getting escalated or if you feel like the other person is at a point where you can't have a decent conversation, I could promise you, and especially for those of you who are who struggle more on the anxious attached end, I promise you when someone is heated, you're not going to get to the resolution that you need to. It's not going to happen. People are just going to tell you what they what you need to hear, or people are like, you're not thinking you're too emotional at that point in time. You're in a fight or flight response. You're not going to resolve any issues. And even if you do resolve it, there's likely going to be some some pending issues later on down the road because you're, you're not making a very clear conscious decision. So have a safe word, whether it's, I need a timeout, um, a safe word or a safe phrase. I need a timeout. Let's pick this back up in an hour. Let's pick this back up tomorrow. Let's uh, let's sleep on this or whatever your safe word or safe phrase is, but make sure it's something that is mutually agreed on. But both people have to be responsive to it. Both people have to honor that and both people have to be okay with it. What's another way that we can signal that we're ready to re-engage? So now we've disengaged, we've given our safe word, we've had some time away from the experience and we're ready to get back into it. What type of sign or signal can we give the, that we're ready for that? I tell people that relationships are difficult, they're challenging, and we have the solutions all at the same time. When it comes to work-related issues, we set up a meeting and everyone knows what that meeting is going to be about. We either send out an agenda or we kind of know from the previous meeting what the next meeting is going to be about. Set an appointment. And a lot of times people don't want to do that or they are reluctant because we shouldn't be doing that in relationships or we think that relationships should just flow. According to who? Whoever said that. And so set up a meeting, uh, whether, you know, hey, let's table this for an hour. Let's table this and let's talk about this um, noon tomorrow. Let's talk about that this weekend at 10. Set an appointment, but this is where I get in the avoidance ass. Make sure that you show up and that you're on time and you're prepared to talk about that at that specific time. Don't schedule other stuff. Don't, you know, make sure that that time when you come back that you have, that you're ready to have dialogue, that you're prepared 
that you're prepared for uh, for some heavy conversations and make sure that you show up and that you're that you're prepared for that. Um, but I, I would schedule an appointment and I would I would set something and I would make sure that both people are prepared. I would encourage for both people to write to write some things down that they are that need to be resolved. And the the other thing that I would encourage for people to do, uh, I don't do couples work anymore, but when I did, uh, I told them to find where the other person is correct. That's hard for people to do. Find where they are correct. Even if you disagree on 90% of, of whatever, find where the other person is correct. Uh, I disagree with you. Let's say that you're arguing about um, going on dates. Um, I I disagree that we should go to the movies, but I agree 100% that we do need to go on dates more often. I don't consider dates a movie. Is there is there a place that we could meet in the middle? Someone. Uh, so I, I struggle. Uh, I've been very open about the fact that I lean more towards and avoid it and something that I've, I've worked through, you know, through the years. Uh, and I remember I was uh, dating someone and uh, she put it beautifully one time where one, one time I was being a, a bit too avoidant and a bit too distant. And she said, uh, you know, I'm okay with you having distance, right? I'm okay with you having your space. Can we turn the dial ever so slightly? Can we turn the dial? Can we meet in the, meet in the middle on this point or on that point? Can we turn the dial ever so slightly? And when you put things into perspective like that, that we're not, uh, and this is where a lot of times people struggle. They want, they think that they should have it all their way or all the other way. When we're, when in reality, we should be trying to find places to meet in the middle. If you, if one person is right all the time, guess what? That means that the other person is wrong all the time, which means that the other person ultimately isn't going to be happy and uh, you're, you're going to lead to impending doom. It just shows that you also don't respect your partner and you're using them to get a need met, although you, you're not thinking about it in those terms, because once again, it's your attachment style. It's what you're used to. This is how you've always done it. That's where we get into the anxious avoidant trap and the manipulation of everything. And I'll, I'll leave it there for that one. But I want to go back to the workplace relationships. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's so important because this yeah. happens all the time where bosses like to ambush their employees. Mm -hmm. they'll, fi they'll find you in the hallway. There's something they've been wanting to talk to you about. You know absolutely nothing about it. Mm -hmm. And you'll just be walking the hallway and they stop you. Hey, you got a minute. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're in the office having a conversation about something that's a little more significant than a, Hey, you got a minute. So if you're a boss, if you're somebody who's a supervisor or a manager, don't, don't do the whole, Hey, you got a minute thing, set an appointment, send an email, give some context. There's nothing wrong with giving a little context. Hey, on Tuesday at 9 a.m., I want to talk about this particular thing and just get some additional information from you. That's a much better way to handle that, and it'll keep your employees happier and not in that state of, am I getting fired today? What's going and on? I, and I think that also going back to being proactive, uh, if you're not planning on firing your person or whatever, and it's just like you just need to resolve the issue, tell them, hey, uh, need to meet with you on you know such such date. Everything's okay, but let's let's talk about this topic or whatever. But give them, you know, uh, I, I tell people, you know, give your give, give your partner, give your coworkers, give people the answer to the test, right? Let you know we we've all the reality of it is, is that we've all been there. You know, we've all been there in terms of, and then we we hate it when people do it to us, but then all of a sudden we do it to other people, oftentimes because we don't know of a better way. But there's several, just like what I was talking about with that with the Chicago Fire. There's there were plenty of exits. There's plenty of ways to resolve these issues. We just tend not to do them. We just go back in the back the way that we came in. And oftentimes the way that we came in was the way that somebody else treated us or or something that someone poorly did to us. And we don't think about how that's impacting other people. But there's there's other ways. But it takes a lot of work for us to get to that point because guess what? We have to read, we have to learn, we have to listen to podcasts like this for us to learn that there's other ways to be able to go about doing things. And another thing you said in relationships is to find a way to see that the other person is correct in their thinking, the way they're perceiving the incident. Because mm -hmm. we we all perceive things happening from our own background and experience. I had a very different family than you had. So I'm going to look at things from a very different perspective. And then we try to integrate ourselves into these relationships, but we're not integrating ourselves. We're very much yeah. two separate people having two very different experiences and not knowing how to communicate that to the other person. So when you can kind of step back and take that third person perspective and see where they're coming from, you're just going to build a, a much better relationship. And especially with an avoidant, you're going to be able to cultivate more trust with them right. and, th and they're going to want to stay 
in that relationship because they're feeling like they can be safe, that they can be themselves and they can express themselves. We forget sometimes that they are our partner. They're with us. They're with us on a journey. Yeah, it's not a competition. It's not a competition and they're not our adversary. And the goal uh, is everyone, when they get into an argument or a disagreement, a lot of times people want to win the disagreement. The goal is not to win. The goal is actually to find areas and, and to actually make sure that your partner gets some of the things that they're looking for through that disagreement uh, and vice versa. So you're able to find some areas that you can meet in the middle where everybody wins instead of just one person winning. When we think about attachment as a whole, my followers and people that make comments on a lot of the stuff that I make, the videos, they seem to wear their attachment style as a badge of honor. I'm avoidant or I'm anxious, whatever the subset is. I see it more as being on a spectrum. Wondering what your thoughts are on that. Can somebody be a little bit avoidant in one area and anxious in another and kind of ambivalent in some other areas. How does that work? Yeah, they uh, you definitely can. And definitely on a spectrum. And it's important to know that it's, that it's on a spectrum, especially for people who are single, because as you begin to become more self-aware, you start to understand who you compare with that might uh, be a really good fit. So for me, when I was on, um, you know, on, on the dating scene, still slightly on the dating scene, but the, but the but what what I was looking for was I had to make sure that uh, I knew right. So we have to understand that if if I'm an avoidant, the likelihood is that I'm going to meet someone that is going to be lean more towards anxious. Now, when I was kind of constructing like who would be a good fit, I knew that someone that was high on the anxious uh, level wasn't going to be a good fit for multiple different reasons. Number one, I travel a lot. Even with me, not, even if avoidant wasn't an issue, I already travel a lot. I already work a lot I already, you know, and I know that's kind of common, common terminology for, for avoidance to use. The, the reality of it is that I know that I'm never, ever, ever going to be perfect. I can make strides and uh, be aware of my behavior, but when things go sideways during high stress, high conflict situations, uh, you're, I'm going to end up being more avoidant than I am anxious. Now. Just like we said, there's a lot of coping skills. There's a lot of strategies that that we can do to uh, to combat that. But we're again, we're never ever going to be perfect, and so we can find people that are gonna are gonna match with us and that are going to be a good fit for that. And, and so it's important to understand that that yes, it, it is on a spectrum. And same thing with someone who who hasn't who might be lean a little bit more towards anxious. Uh, that you're likely going to find or you're likely going to pair with a partner that leans a little bit more avoidant. Now, where uh, they're on that, where, where they are on that spectrum uh, is dependent on that person and, and what is going to be the right fit for you. But we have to understand that in all relationships, people are going to tend to lean a bit more towards avoidant, lean, lean a bit more towards uh, towards anxious. There's not going to be a perfect person, even a secure attached person, you know, because I think that's where everyone thinks that. Uh, people think that if they find someone who has a secure attachment, that everything is just going to be golden, that they're never going to avoid conflict. They're never going to over pursue. And that's just not true. Even a secure attached person is going to have, uh, you know, they might want to, you know, might need a timeout. They might want to resolve things right here, right now. Right. And so, so we have to understand that, yes, it, uh, it, it is, you know, it is on a spectrum. And to go back to, to your original question, that we could show up very differently in different areas. We have to remember that this is how we show up to the world and how we're resolving our own trust issues. Our focus is in on our pain. So an avoidant attached person, let's say going back to one of your examples, you might be a supervisor um, at work and you might feel like you're losing control over your team. So you might show up like you're an anxious attached person at work as a supervisor or uh, and, and other areas because you're losing control. The and micromanaging. So, mm-hmm. And you might do that because you're managing your team, but you might be doing that because you're actually avoiding conflict with your supervisor. So that's how that might be showing up and how your self-sabotaging behavior might be showing up. Let's get back to dating for a second and talk about dating apps. What do you think of them? Are they beneficial? I'm not a big fan of dating apps. I try to get all, if not uh, if not all, majority of the people I work with off of dating apps. I'm not anti-dating apps, but especially people who struggle with the, with an attachment style, especially if you're trying to work through it, think that it has the potential of making matters worse. So you have an avoidant and have 
five different people that are trying to talk to you at once, which sounds, which, which is great when you're on the dating scene. And at the same time, when a person you're trying to develop a relationship with a person and uh, things get a bit difficult or they don't respond quick enough. And it's just easy for the avoidant to say, I got five other people I can connect with. And so that, so it makes it difficult for you to, to find and choose just one person to get to know and to develop a deeper relationship with. And it, it makes it easy escape route when things get difficult or that person, that, uh, that partner wants to become exclusive or wants to commit, or you start to realize that the relationship is requiring a bit more intimacy than what you might want. Also, I don't, I'm not sure if it's great for the anxious attached partner. First minute that, you know, the minute that you like someone or you connect with someone and they don't respond within um, X amount of time and uh, your mind automatically goes to, they must be screwing somebody else. They must have connected with somebody else. And what, what does an avoidant do? They go, or not an avoidant, an anxious partner do? Go right back to the phone. You know, hey, are you still interested? The snap, blah, blah, blah. You know, uh, you must have connected with somebody else. I remember an experience that I had. There was a, someone I was genuinely interested in. And uh, I was literally at work and in meetings and you must be, you must have met somebody else online this, and, and was genuinely interested. In. Um, but the behavior definitely wasn't where I'm at now, but the behavior definitely turned me off at the time. You know, I, I wasn't online or anything like that, but uh, that was the perception of someone from coming from an anxious attachment style that I could potentially lose this person at the drop of a hat because an anxious attached partner thinks that, that person has one foot out the door. An anxious attached partner, here's something that's not talked about enough as anxious attached people um, struggle with is that they put people on a pedestal and oftentimes it's because they lack self-worth themselves. So they are looking for someone that they can put on a pedestal and they don't think that they have any type of worth unless they connect with someone that in their mind has a high level of worth. And so they will oftentimes cling too tight because they think that if this person leaves or if, um, if I can't connect with this person, that I'm not worth it. You doing that multiple different times over the course of a week can definitely have a negative impact on your self-esteem, your self-worth. So for those reasons, I try to get people off of online dating if they if that's their experience. Get get back out. Get and what the reason why I do this is that it forces people to go live a healthy life. Go yeah. find a hobby. Go get into running. Get into a running club get into a cycling club, get into a chess club. Um, someone who I'm working with right now, they got back into cooking and making candy and things like that. And they're meeting all sorts of people. But what's happening is that they're meeting people in a healthy way. And uh, they're noticing that that anxiety that, the, that they're yep. having, that that pressure that they, that they have in meeting people on dating apps just isn't there. They're just able to just meet people they're able to kind of judge whether or not this is a person, this is a person that I'm interested in or not. And it's just more of a natural flow. And that's how we met people when, you know, when you ask people, when was dating easy? That's how, that's how we met people in school, right? Yeah. Is that in the late 1900s. Thought, right. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so do you think people are more uh, avoidant in relationships today? Are they leaning more in that direction because of dating apps and social media and the way that we interact with each other? I don't know if they're leaning more avoidant. Um, I think that it's probably about, uh, I would, I mean, I don't have statistics on it, but I would say that it's probably about 50, 50 avoidant versus, uh, versus anxious. What happens, and this is going in kind of a different direction. What happens when you get that random breakup? I just made a video on this where you're dating somebody, things are going along just fine. And then all of a sudden the breakup comes and you're mm -hmm. caught, you're caught completely off guard. You have no idea what's happening, what's going on. We were just fine a week ago. Yeah. Maybe we had some issues a couple months ago, but I thought we resolved that. I thought we got back to normal. And now all of a sudden the breakup comes, you're completely caught off guard. I'm going to give it from two perspectives. So let's start out with the avoidant. If you're with someone who's an avoidant, or if you are the avoidant attached person, oftentimes they start to realize that the relationship is requiring more intimacy and is requiring a level of commitment and is requiring a level of vulnerability. You have to remember that that's what the avoidant is afraid of. They're afraid of, of, of vulnerability. They're afraid of deep intimacy. Now keep in mind, here's what's strange and here's the reason why it's confusing with an avoidant. They want intimacy. They want a relationship. They want all of these things, and but uh, they're also afraid of them because, uh, in either in previous relationships or in childhood, that's what was taken advantage of. They were vulnerable, and then 
people used their vulnerability against them and violated their trust. And so it could be that the relationship is starting to require that and the avoidant now is uh, is too afraid of being hurt again and so they pull away and then they ghost or guess what this is the part that people don't talk about enough is that sometimes if it's on the anxious attached partners end you can sabotage the relationship you can over you can over pursue you can move the relationship faster than what the other person uh, is thinking sometimes another thing that i see a lot with avoidance is that um that they project what they want from the relationship onto a relationship that hasn't matured to that level completely. And so they move the relationship too quickly, meaning, and so it's date three and you're already talking about, um, you know, meeting each other's kids or, you know, something that maybe that other person isn't, isn't quite ready for. You and, should be uh, prepared to know that you right. want to marry me by the end of the year. Yeah, exactly. Then all of a sudden with, especially with someone with high anxiety, high anxious attached style at, at that point might think that they're with a narcissist or might think that they're with someone who is avoidant, but sometimes it's, it's our own, it's our own bad behavior. Are there any other areas where our attachment style shows up that we just might not be aware of? Uh, definitely. I think that one uh, area that isn't talked about enough is how we show up as parents. And I think this is probably the biggest way, one of the biggest reasons why people need to work on their attachment style is that we begin to, we don't realize that our attachment style is being passed on and affecting and impacting our children. So uh, your child, if you have an avoidant attachment style, guess what? You might lack a lot of depth in the relationship with your with your child. You might be a lot a lot more cold. You might be um, projecting and and um, pushing hyper independence on your child. Um, as an uh, anxious attached uh, parent, you might be a helicopter parent. You might not be giving your child an, enough space for them to develop as an individual. And your child likely um, might be developing some codependent skills. Um, they might feel like it's their responsibility to keep you happy all the time, to soothe your anxiety, to so soothe your, your big emotions. And they don't get an opportunity to develop or learn how to soothe their own big emotions. And so this, this can have a dramatic impact on your children. And then um, ultimately, it impacts how they relate to the world and how they find dating partners as well. I'm actually really glad you brought this up. I had a video go viral a couple months ago and it brought up a lot of different emotion from people in the comments section. And it was one of those videos where I was taking, you know, my own personal experience. The, the thing that really, uh, I think caught people off guard was the idea of being able to see your parent as the injured child that they once were. Mm -hmm. And that is so hard for people who have had negative experiences with their own parents to then at 40 years old, take a look back, just see them from the perspective of being an injured child, and then navigate your way through your parents' experience of becoming a young adult, having mm -hmm. children. And then you start to realize, well, they had money issues and they couldn't afford things. And there were, you know, several different types of difficulties that were, that were happening and things that they never told you, things you were unaware of. How can we as adults get ourselves in that position where we can start to think about things a little bit differently, not, not to forgive them necessarily, but to get rid of that blame and the shame and the anger and the frustration, the guilt and the depression that we associate with that so that we can set ourselves free. How can we navigate that? It starts with you. It starts with you forgiving yourself and learning about yourself. And the more that you become self-aware and the more that you begin to understand the reason for your own behavior, you begin to start to understand why people or how people came up the, with the decision and the conclusion and why people are treating other people the way that they are. One of the things I tell people is what goes in is what comes out. So if your parents mistreated you or if they were kind of cold or whatever, the likelihood is that that's how they were treated. That's what they were taught. And I also tell people that we have to remember that our parents, they didn't have all the resources that we do now. They didn't have TikTok. They didn't have channels like yours or mine to be able to teach them or to be able to have conversations or podcasts to be able to have conversations. Don't tell people so, that. They yeah. get angry. I don't want to say it gives them an excuse for the bad behavior. But we can also understand why and how they came up to came to those conclusions and came to the, the decisions that they did. I think it's interesting because you see your parent in old age and they never had the opportunity or took the opportunity to go to therapy, to heal whatever they needed to heal within themselves. But they also lack the self-awareness to have ever been able to do that. And it goes back to what you just said and the fact that, you know, yeah, there were some tools that existed. Yes. Mm -hmm. But were they as uh, prevalent or relevant as 
they are today. And did we mm -hmm. have those tools? We just didn't have it back then. And so it's not making excuses for anything that happened. It's not excusing the behavior or the circumstances or the things that, that you experienced in your lifetime. It's just recognizing the reality of the way things actually are. And I, I think that people use the word excuses a lot because we think that if we give understanding that that means we're allowing for excuses but understanding doesn't mean that the excuses are relevant it's just understanding right understanding um how something can happen we have to understand going back to how we open this up we have to understand ground zero we have to understand how we got to this point so then we don't repeat those same cycles and that's what taking responsibility and ownership and what what our responsibility is, because we, like I said, if we don't, if we don't have some level of understanding, we're just going to continue to repeat these same toxic behaviors. How important is forgiveness? Is it forgiveness or is it acceptance? Which one? I think so. Forgiveness and acceptance go hand in hand. Um, I think that uh, forgiveness is not a requirement. I think self forgiveness is important, um, but I think that you can get to a place of acceptance without forgiving them. And there's a lot of people in my life that I've accepted the behavior, accepted, you know, what's happened. I'll never talk to them again, but you know, I, I right. um, but um, you know, so forgiveness is depending on the person, but I do think that acceptance is, uh, is important that you're not carrying, carrying things around, carrying the weight around, um, not wanting revenge and things like that. But um, so I, I think acceptance is, is key, but forgiveness is on a case by case basis. Matt, I want to thank you for today and sharing your expertise with the life and breath community. Let everybody know how uh, they can find you, what you offer. Uh, so you can find me on, so I'm Matthew L. Pfeiffer on all social media platforms. You can Google Matt Pfeiffer coaching and it'll pull up everything. I have a podcast, the Matt Pfeiffer experience. I'm all over YouTube. Uh, I have most of, most of my services. If you go to the link in my bio, I offer a lot of free courses. If you're struggling with co-parenting, I've, uh, things in there for attachment style, but yeah, most, most things you can, you can grab from me for free. Just let, let me know where to send it. And, uh, and we go from there. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here and I'm sure we'll do this again. All right. And that's all we have for you guys today. Thank you for joining us today on the blueprint podcast. Make sure you click the subscribe button and share with your friends on social media and tag me in it at Jaybird. Fit. That's J-B-I-R-D-F-I-T.